All right, good morning. Welcome to the last week of Guts. Um, I'm kind of happy that that's going to be the last time we play that video because, well, I love the song, but I, I, you know, you see all these fit people and they're all exercising and they're all doing all these healthy things and then cut to me. I remember I ran one time for some reason. Okay, so anyway, so we're comparing that kind of same thing that it, that it takes, it takes guts to follow Jesus. And when he says, hey, I want you to I want you to follow me. He's asking you to do something that is very, very difficult. Uh, we can wrap up this whole ser se uh, series with one quote from one of my favorite theologians, G.K. Chesterton. If you've never heard of him, uh, he was just one of the coolest uh, cats to come out of the 20th century uh, in, in theology. But he said this. He said, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. In other words, we don't have people come to, come to me very often and be like, hey, you know what, I tried, I tried reading the Bible and living it out in my life, and I gotta tell you what, I did it, I accomplished it, I, I did it for like a year, I did it for like two years, and man, it was just dumb, didn't work, wasn't good, it was bad for me. People don't do that. If you actually live out what Scripture says and you begin to follow after God and you give your life completely to Him, on the other side of that, it is life transforming. The only people that don't really understand it and get it are the ones that looked at it and went, man, it's just too difficult. I know I'm going to have to make changes about my life and I don't want to do that. I know I'm going to have to change my my view of the world and I don't want to do that. It sounds like it's going to be really tough to have faith. And I, I don't want to do that. And that's why people walk away from faith. And basically we're saying, hey, listen, Jesus, Jesus didn't call you to something easy. He called you to something that takes, it takes a lot of guts. So here's what we've been doing. We've been talking about these churches in the book of Revelation. Um, we've been talking about uh, these seven churches. What I love about these churches is that Jesus addresses them himself. He addresses these seven churches and he says, hey, I want you to specifically hear something that I have to say to you. Each church has its own personality. So he says kind of the same general stuff to each of the churches, but he tailors it just a little bit because every church has its own personality. Here's the personality of LifeBridge. We serve pumpkin pie for, for breakfast. At, like, anybody know? Yeah, yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. It was so fun to see people like building a tower of pumpkin pie or of uh, whipped cream on their pumpkin pie, right? So that's just each church has its own personality. We're kind of like the golden retriever of personalities, okay? So each church has that. Each of these seven churches has kind of its own personality. In other words, there were things that they were doing right and things that they were doing wrong. So I want to show you the map again. These are the seven churches. This is in modern-day Turkey. Uh, these seven churches, the first week I talked about the first two, which is uh, Ephesus and Smyrna. So I talked about these two churches. Here was the message that Jesus had for those churches. Basically, hey guys, I know you. Know your deeds. I know how difficult it is for you. I know what challenges face you. And I also know how you've been responding to those. And you have been responding to those very well. And I know it's difficult where you're at. The context that you're living out your faith is very difficult because you've got people that are opposing you. You've got the Jews that are opposing you. You've got the Romans that are opposing you. It is not a popular thing to follow me where you're at. And I know it's difficult, but listen. But that doesn't change my expectations for you. Just because it's difficult does not make me want to say, hey, I'll just make it a little bit easier for you. No, I expect you to follow me without compromise, especially because it's difficult where you're at. That's what Jesus said the first week. The second week, uh, Kenny talked last week, and uh, I, I did kind of a cruel trick to Kenny. There's seven churches that we packed into three weeks. I got two churches the first week. And, and two churches today, and I gave him three. So basically the phone call went like this. Hey, Kenny, can you put three hours worth of content into a 30-minute message? <laughs> Thanks. Figure it out and don't call me. That's kind of how, how that works. So anyway, he had, he had three churches, did a great job last week. Uh, he talked about these three churches, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis. I love, 
I love what he brought out of this, that all three of these churches had the same problem. They had some housekeeping that they needed to do. They needed to get in and they needed to clean house. The church in Pergamum, they were, they were struggling because they had allowed false teaching to come into the church. And they had allowed false teachers to just say things that were very appealing but not true. Uh, the church in Thyatira, they had allowed teachings about sexual immorality to just come into the church. And people had compromised. And people had said there was teaching in the church that said, hey, you can have sex with your girlfriend. You can, you can go to orgies. You can be sexually immoral and follow Jesus. Don't worry about it. It's okay. You can do those two things. And Jesus said to them, hey, you need to take care of business. You need to go in and you need to make sure that those people aren't teaching that. And then finally, the church in Sardis, he didn't have much to good to say. He didn't open with a, a nice thing. He was just like, hey, you guys, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. You need to wake up. And throughout these churches, you just see Jesus being compassionate and loving and direct and bold. And you really get to know the heart of who Jesus is. Today, there's these final two churches, and I really want you to take these to heart. These final two churches could not be more different. There's Philadelphia, and there's Laodicea. And these two churches couldn't be more different because, La because Philly, uh, in Philadelphia, they were, being, they were being faithful to the point where Jesus didn't even say anything negative to them. So the church in Philadelphia, they're doing good. They're not living in any kind of compromise. And the church in Laodicea was absolutely in 100% compromise. And we're going to see the difference between how Jesus interacts with these two churches. So the first one's Philadelphia. Uh, I would just encourage you, go to Revelation chapter 3. If you don't have uh, the Bible app, you should grab the Bible app and, and read these on your phone. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, goes like this. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. What, what's, so what does that mean? Well, it means that God has the keys. He's got the keys to the kingdom. He's got the keys to the world. Like, just a reminder here, I know it seems like the Romans are in control. I know that the, the Jews are the ones that are coming after you, and it seems like they have a lot of power. But I just need you to remember, like, I'm the only one with the keys, okay? I can open doors and I can shut doors and nobody else can do that. He continues. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. Now, he doesn't explain what this is to the church in Philadelphia, but I think they probably all nodded their head and went, yep, we know exactly what you're talking about. He has opened a door that no one can shut, and he's laid it for them, an opportunity to do what God has called them to do. And he's like, hey, see, look, I'm in control. You have this open door, and it's only been provided to you by God. And he continues on. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and not, have not denied my name. He's proud of the church in Philadelphia. They're, they're doing really good. Now he's going to get ready to say something that's, that's actually pretty intense. It's pretty heavy. So because this is a church that does not live in any kind of compromise, uh, he's going to turn to this church and he's going to say, listen, I'm on your side, and I'm on your side in kind of a, in a big, scary way. But let, me, let me give you an example. You remember the part in The Lion King? where uh, Mufasa, and I'm not talking about the Broadway show because I'm from Nebraska, I don't do that. Um, I'm talking about like the cartoon, right? So it, it, Mufasa is like this awesome big lion. He's got James Earl Jones' voice, and I just love this scene. It really gives me uh, chills, love this. Simba is under attack, right, from these hyenas, and they can easily rip them apart, but, but Simba's dad can take care of those hyenas. Here, let me just jog your memory by watching the clip. Was it? <laughs> <laughs> 
He's sorry. If you ever come near my son again. Oh, this is this is your son. Oh, yours. <laughs> Did you know that? No, me. I, I didn't know. No. Did you? No, of course not. No. Ed. <laughs> Doodles. Love that scene, right? Love, love that scene. Mufasa comes in and saves the day. The Christians in Philadelphia are being faithful, but they have people who are opposing them. There is this group called the synagogue, which Jesus refers to as the synagogue of Satan. These people who are opposing the Christians in the town, and they are making them the outcasts of the town. In some ways, they're doing this through ridicule, and they're just making them feel bad about following Jesus, but in lots of ways, they're like doing what Paul was doing originally, where he's like, he's like out to get them, to imprison them, to kill them. And in this situation, in this context, they are kind of outnumbered, and they don't have the control, and they don't have the power. The, the Christians don't. And in that context, they've got to be starting to feel kind of weak and outnumbered, and they've got to think about maybe compromising in their faith, but they have not compromised. And so this is what Jesus says. And listen, this is pretty heavy. This is pretty heavy what Jesus says. Check it out. He says, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Now, I don't know about you, but that gives me chills. You know, it says in Philippians chapter 3 that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I don't know about you, uh, we don't face probably the same persecution that they do in Philly, <laughs> but I know the persecution that we face sometimes is a little bit lighter, but maybe you're a student at the high school, middle school, and man, to, to be a Christian doesn't even feel like a real option to you. But those of you who, are being, who have been faithful, I just want you to know, there's a day where you're going to stand before judgment and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Be on the right side of that situation. I'm not saying God's going to give us the opportunity to, but we might have the opportunity to say, I told you so! It may not feel great, but we might have that opportunity. Jesus is watching. Maybe the place where you work, it's very difficult. You've probably brought up the Jesus thing. It just doesn't go very far, and you feel like you're the only little bit of light in that darkness. But you need to know, Jesus is watching, and he's going, man, I just, I just might make those people you work with come and fall down at your feet and admit that I have loved you. He continues on. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to entest the inhabitants of the earth. Not quite sure, again, what he means. It's, it's something in their immediate context. There's lots of different things it could have been. There was all kinds of, there's all kinds of war that broke out uh, during this time period. It could, uh, could have been exactly that. But he says, hey, you've been faithful. I'm going to spare you from this time because you have been so faithful to me. Next verse. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That is his message to a church that's killing it. They're faithful. They're absolutely living without compromise, and they are being ridiculed and persecuted for it. 
I don't know about you, but if Jesus all of a sudden broke through the clouds and said, hey, Grant, I've got a message for you. I want, I want to say something to you. I would want him to write the letter of the church in Philadelphia. Hey, you're being faithful, and because of that, you have the biggest reward you could possibly have in your life. Now, this is a sharp contrast between the next church. The next church is living in 100% compromise. It's the church of Laodicea. If you've ever studied these before, you kind of know that the church in Laodicea is, is infamous because they are in the middle of compromise. Here's what he says to them. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness. In other words, it's God, uh, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Now, the feeling that he has here is that same feeling that I have about once a week. About once a week, I have a cup of coffee, and I'm sitting beside the computer, and I don't realize that an hour and a half has gone by, and I'm just going like this, and I reach over, and I take the coffee, and I sip it in my mouth, right? And it's cold, and I'm typing along, and I'm just like, <laughs> right? And keep going. You ever do that? It's just like you can't, you can't hold it in your mouth. It's completely worthless because it's not hot. Or that same feeling you have when you go camping, and you take pop with you, and somebody forgot to bring the ice, and you're out there, and there's no ice, and so you get like a nice 98-degree Mountain Dew. Mmm. <laughs> right? You don't want that. Jesus is saying, hey, you guys are worthless. You are tasteless in my mouth. I don't want to be anywhere near you. Because you're neither hot nor you're cold, I want to spit you completely out of my mouth. Now, I want to be clear what he's talking about here. He's not talking about indecision. Because some of you out there might be kind of undecided right now. And that's okay. Some of you might come to church and you're like, you know what? I, I don't really know if I'm ready to do this whole Jesus thing or not. I don't know if I'm really ready to follow after him. Because that means I would like have to change my life. I would, have to, I would probably have to start changing the people that I, that I hang out with. I would probably have to start changing my view on the world. I would have to start changing my relationships. I would have to start abstaining from things that I got to be honest with you, I really enjoy doing. So I don't know if I'm ready to follow Jesus. And you might be in kind of that undecided group. That is not what he's talking about here. He's, he's not talking about indecision. Like my, my wife and my daughter are in, in the undecided people. They, they have a really hard time making a decision. Like if I send them to the store to get marshmallows, you know, if they go to the store, that's going to be a while because both of them are going to stand there in front of the two kinds of marshmallows that there are. And they're going to go, should we get the Jiffy Puff? Or should we, get the, should we get the generic brand? Should we get the Jiffy Puff? Or should we get, I don't know. Well, these are a little bit more, and they will both just stand there, and it's very hard for them to make a decision. My boys and I, on the other hand, if you send us to the store to get marshmallows, we will try to grab marshmallows without even slowing down, right? If we can grab the marshmallows without stopping, we might come home with a bag of rice. You know, there's... <laughs> You never know. That kind of indecision is not what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about somebody that is living in compromise. In other words, and it's so important that you hear me on this. In other words, he's talking about people that have said, yeah, I want to follow Jesus. I want to live for Jesus. Where's the, where's the baptismal? Let's make this happen. Right? I want to follow Jesus. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to be a Christian. Hey, everybody, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower. But, but I mean, I'm still going to go ahead and do what I want to do. I'm still going to live how I want to live. I'm still going to view the world how I want to view the world. But I'm going to feel really good about it because I'm going to church and I'm living for Jesus. And Jesus says, listen, I, I appreciate your effort, but no thank you. That is not what I want from you. I remember the first time I came to Jesus. The first time I came to Jesus. I remember it. I was there. I was reading. I was actually reading my Bible and I got down on my knees and I, I prayed and I, I said, God, I'm, I want to be yours. And I was like, and I just, you know, I'm going to completely live for you. I'm just, I'm not going to tell anybody about it. I mean, I was at high school at the time, so I was like, you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to, nobody needs to know. I'll just live for you. 
and, and that'll happen. And it's like God revoked my application. Yeah, I got a, did the whole thing, did the whole spiel, my heart was there, and God's like, no, I don't. <laughs> no, thank you. I don't want part of you. I want it all. That's the church in Laodicea. They come and they say, yep, we're going to live for you, but they're not, they're not actually going to live for him. They want their cake, and they want to eat it too. They're living in compromise. And I got to say, this is why this is so important. So many Christians, so many people that go to church, they come to church, they make the decision to, to go to church or to believe in Jesus, but they never change. They never make the tough choices. They never abstain from sin. Their life doesn't change. They continue to view the world through the same lens that they've always viewed the world. And I want you to know, if that's you, Jesus is saying, no, thank you. You are sickening in my mouth, and I will spit you out. I wish that you were either hot or cold. I wish you were as far away from me as you could get, or I wish you were 100% in. That would be better. He continues on. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you were wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. The church in Laodicea to me is like, uh, it's like the Kardashians, right? I, the Kardashians have everything that every American could ever want, right? They got fame, they got fortune, they got, every, they got all the clothes they could possibly want. They don't always wear them, but they've got all the clothes that they could possibly want. Everything that they need, they, they have. And yet they are broken in their soul. They're as far away from their creator as they could get. And God's saying, hey, you say I'm rich? You say that I've acquired everything? But listen, you, you don't realize you are lost, poor, pitiful, blind, and naked. I want you to come to me, and I want you to give you the resources that I can give you. Don't be proud of the actual gold you have. Come and get the spiritual gold that I have for you. I can completely transform your life. He continues. Those who I, whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Hey, if you're feeling rebuked in your spirit, and you're going, boy, that is, that's me. Like, I'm the church in Laodicea. I really got excited about following Jesus, but somewhere along the lines, nothing ever changed. That's cool. If you're feeling rebuked right now, that means that God loves you. I love and rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. That's what he wants. He wants you to give the opportunity. Listen, it's not too late. That doesn't mean anything. It means just right out. Maybe you got some wires crossed along the line. Maybe you like, like listened to something that you shouldn't have listened to or believed in something you shouldn't have believed. That's fine. Just right now, I want you to know, just repent. I'm standing at the door knocking. Just open your heart, repent, and I will come in and change it all. He wraps it up this way. To the one who is victorious... I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my Father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Today, I want to put it fully in your hands, okay? I want to ask you this question. Are you in or are you out? Because there is a definitive line that Jesus draws and says, listen, I'm going to do it. It's going to be a work that I'm going to do in your life. I'm the one with the power. I'm the one with the keys. I'm the one with the spirit that's going to transform your life. I'm going to do the work, but what I need you to do is I need you to be in or I need you to be out. But I can't do anything if you're right there in the middle. One of the most dangerous things for somebody to do is to believe that they have faith in God but not actually have faith in God. One of the most dangerous things for somebody to do is to come to church 
every week and kind of feel better about who they are, but not actually put their faith in God. And Jesus is saying, listen, you just, you got to be in or you got to be out. Anything else is about as weenie as you can get. It's just about as weak as you can get. You're really going to come and you're going to half do this thing. My, uh, my father-in-law was the preacher that married my wife and I. I just can't imagine if I'm standing up there and he's marrying us. And right in the middle of my vows, he was just like, you know, for better or for worse, are you completely committed to my daughter? And just right in the middle of it, I was like, you know, I don't know. Most of the way. If I was just like, you know what? Yes, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> right? And I kind of winked at him and elbowed, right? No, no. No, like he wants to know. It's my daughter. Are you all in or are you all out? That's what God wants to know from you. Are you all in or are you all out? And that's a tough decision that is lived out through your life. Now, today we have, a, we have an opportunity today to make that all-in decision. Maybe you've been going to church going, yep, I'm just going to continue to kind of be the person that I've always sort of been, and I'm going to go to church, and, and you know, nobody really needs to know about it. <laughs> I don't need to let this change my life or anything. Maybe you're realizing today, I need to be all-in in this thing, and maybe... Maybe you've never been baptized, or maybe you were baptized when you were a kid, or maybe you've had some sort of religious experience in your life that you've always felt like, well, that, that qualifies. That's okay. Listen, Jesus wants you to publicly, before everybody here today and before all your friends in the world, he wants you to acknowledge that you have loved him. So today we have the baptism uh, service that's going to be here in just a few minutes. If you came in here today and you weren't planning on being baptized, going all the way and saying I'm all in, that's okay. We got shorts, we got t-shirts, we got everything uh, that you could possibly want. All you have to do here in just a little bit is move on to the back. Keith will be back there to talk you through that and get you all set up. But whatever it is, I challenge you today, make that decision. Maybe you already got baptized. Maybe you got excited about it, you got baptized, you thought the water was going to change you and nothing really happened, and you didn't realize that it was going to really take tough steps by you. Maybe your decision today isn't to get baptized, but to, to finish what you started. Let me pray for you.